All right, good afternoon, everybody. If you just give me a second to mute everybody who's not on mute, and then we can get going. That should be everybody. Welcome to the post-match press conference with director of rugby, Jake White, after round two of the Heineken Champions Cup fixture against Exeter Chiefs. Um, we will start our round of questions with JJ and then Ashfaq followed by um, Caleb. If you just could give me a second, um, and once coach is back in his seat, we can then start. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. cool. Uh, JJ, Ashfaq, Caleb, then Leighton, in that order, please. Uh, hi, Jake. Um, a bit of a heavy loss today, but... Um, what, what's the positives that you can take out of these first two weeks uh, out of the Champions Cup rugby? JJ, yeah, it was a tough one. Um, I mean, obviously, no one, no coach likes to lose. Um, the positives are, I suppose, that, uh, you know, we've got a batch of young guys who come out here, second half, 14-7. Um, you know, I just said to the media that I chatted to, yeah, they've got a very, very good team, well coached. Same coach has been with them for a while. This batch of players is... As, uh, as have been real, real uh, champions. I mean, they, the team they've had is well oiled, um, and you can't, as I said, to give them ten penalties in the first half and they get thirty-two points. It's always going to be an uphill battle. So, you know, the positives are we didn't lie down and die the second half. If you consider that was twelve-seven second half, um, you know, when they put their reserves on and we played our our other guys, our youngsters. You know, we probably we probably matched them. So tough ask. Uh, I repeat myself. We flew here, twenty six hour travel. Um, yeah, difficult, very difficult to come and play away from home. Thirty five degrees back home. You know, minus two year, minus four year in the evenings. You know, warm day, six degrees today. Very difficult challenge. But hey, you know that's uh, that's what this competition's about, JJ. We've got to if you want to win it, you got to you got to grow in this competition. Hi, Jake. It's Ashfaq here. Um, you know, a 30-point defeat is a 30-point defeat, but you guys had opportunities, especially in the first half. Um, Bismarck being held up, it seemed like the guy came in from the side there. It could have been a penalty tie and yellow card even. And after that, another one held up over the line. Um, exactly. I mean, if you had those opportunities, it could have been a very different ball game. Exactly. I mean, it's funny that you say that. I mean, I thought that guy came from the side, could have been a penalty try. The guy who tackled Reinhard Ludwig, was lying on the ground off sides as well. So probably two yellow cards there, Ashfaq. But then those are the margins, you know, those are, that's what this competition does. You know, we had our chances and then, I mean, we, you know, we, we basically got held up Then they kicked off and then we got a scrum. We gave them a scrum. They got a penalty and the next thing they scored. So it was like a 14 point swing. But, you know, I was just looking at this play at this sheet, you know, you got Johnny Gray, you got Stuart Hogg, you got Jenkins, who's from Wales. You got those two other guys from Scotland. Or Lachlan comes from Ireland. You got Scott Sear from Australia. You got uh, the flanker from Wales. Got an Argentinian player on the bench. Another, you know, Australian on the bench. Uh, Tongan on the bench and a South African on the bench. So, you know, that's that's what you're playing against. Um, it, you know, it's a it's definitely much tougher competition than people think. I fuck. So, we had our chances. Um, didn't take them. And then, as I said, just made too many mistakes. Ten penalties in the first half. Gave them entries into our 22, and they were, I mean, they were phenomenal. They're probably the best team, you know, that we've ever played against and the best team we've ever analyzed in terms of their hit rate when they get into your 22. So, you know, that they, they just, it just basically reaffirms that you can't give them entries into your 22. They, they, they will, they'll make it comfortable for themselves. And Jake, just quickly, you spoke about the 10 penalties. I mean, the, the breakdown sometimes, Bismarck was quite heavily penalized, but sometimes it seemed like, he did have the rights, but he was still blown up. Um, scrums as well. Scrums as well. Um, so many penalties. Yeah, that's interesting. Because eh? when I chatted to Bismarck, he said a couple of times they played him from the side. Um, and again, it's just, uh, you know, sometimes you get rewarded, sometimes you didn't, you know. And 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 I spoke, I'll tell you one thing about this Exeter team. They're so good that they can hold the ball for 20 phases. So if you don't go at the breakdown, they get comfortable and they just basically move you around. Um 
So it's like a balance, you know, as I said, it's a very good team. They will be up there at the end of this competition. I've got no doubt about it. Um, and, and, and the learnings we have is either you've got to be accurate at the breakdown or you've got to defend properly. You can't, you know, you can't do, you can't give penalties away and get into your 22. At the same time, you can't give them quick ball all the time. They're good enough to hold on to it for phases. So, you know, and scrum wise, I thought we'd been unlucky. The first scrum was a penalty, you know, against us. I think a couple of times we, we, you know, we weren't rewarded at scrum time. Uh, but again, you know, I went to the ref afterwards. I thought, he, I thought, you know, with times that he, I said to him, well done. You know, they get a lot of flack. Sometimes I thought, I thought the flow of the game, I thought he blew the things he saw um, and he handled the, the way that he did. You know, I, having looked now, it's easy for me to look back at that, you know, that, that try that they came from the side and stopped Bismarck and the guy lying on the ground off sides. But the referee obviously didn't see it like that. So you've got, you've got, to, you've got to accept it. Yeah, Jake, um, I think the score flutters exit a little bit. They were good on the ground, but there's some decisions um, the Bulls made in terms of trying to offload into contact um, and losing a couple of balls. I think I found about three of those that, mm. that were clear attacking opportunities and overlap on the side. Is that a sign of a young team that's going to learn because such mistakes will get heavily punished in a competition of this pedigree? 100%. You know, if you consider Cameron Hunnicom, and I'm just using names, Sebastian Lobard's 20 years old playing in the tight mm. Both locks are 20. One's 23, one's 20. Uh, you know, VA Stein Camp is 22, the two scrum halves are 20s, Trevino's young. Um, they're gonna have to learn, you know. That's that's the that's the enormity of this competition. You know, this they punish you, you know, they, you get a chance, they you know, whether they hold you up legally or illegally, you don't take it, then uh, you know, then you get punished. And and I say it again, Exeter will be there at the end of the competition. I've got no doubt about that. That's a, you know, there's still some couple of guys that didn't play today that are still going to come back. When you look at Johannes Kirsten and, and Jacques Vermeulen, uh, those two guys will probably be in the mix in the next couple of weeks as well. So they'll get, you know, they'll, they'll be there at the back end. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, to do better against them or play against them in, 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 at Loftus and, and get a win. And that'll put our campaign back on track. Um, just a follow up, Jake, quickly. Um because there's been talk that it's a it's a competition that you've already considered the fact that it's a difficult competition if you have to win this one you have to beat a La Rochelle um and and one of the big guns in three weekends in a row away from home yeah. um and considering yeah. you made the final last year of the URC um in your mind if you're asked to look at the two competitions in terms of which one you'd prioritize to build momentum for the next three or four seasons with a young team you're signed to 2027 does that do you think you have to do that or you're trying to go for both? So, Boo, let me tell you what I really want. I want Jacques Vermillion to come back to South Africa. I want uh, Janus Caleb, Kirsten but thanks. <laughs> I want Janus Kirsten to come back. So, I want Hannah Liebenberg to come back to South Africa. I want Malcolm Marks to come back to South Africa. And then I'll prioritize both competitions. That's what I want. You know, I think the youngsters I've got now are doing phenomenally well. I need to blend them with a couple of guys between the ages of 25 and 30. Um, so, you know, without saying one competition or another, long term in my next, you know, five year stint, get some of these older guys back, target both competitions, blood these youngsters so they can play with some really strong senior, you know, sort of uh, hardened uh, professionals. And then we can go for both. I think as we stand now, as I said to you, not being defeatist, it's realistic. You know, I read out their team now and I told you again, two Scottish guys, two Welsh guys, two South Africans, a Tongan, a, 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 a Argentinian. That's how they build their team. In other words, how they how they add to their, their good players, which are Luke Cowan, Dickey, England, you know, uh, that, 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 that they view as England. Uh, the list just goes on and on. And, you, and when you bring those guys into your club, your club gets stronger. So I hope I'm answering the question, Sabu. I think for me, it's uh, I'd like to win both. But I also know that with the squads we have now competing with the squads other clubs have, it's a it's a very big uphill ask. Especially as I said to you, you have to on three weekends. It can work out. You play La Rochelle in the quarterfinals to lose in the semifinals and Leinster in the final. I don't think there are many clubs in 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 anywhere that have got the depth of being able to back up three consecutive games like that um, and win the competition and obviously play in the URC. It's taken Leinster years and years and years, and it's taken Exeter. Um, a long time with this group of players to be where they are as well. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's basically where we need to get to. I'd like to keep the really talented youngsters and, and fill them up with some senior hardened men that come back to South Africa. 
Cheers, Jake. It's Thanks, Caleb. Caleb. Thanks. Thank Hi, you, um, Jake. Just in, in the press room, yeah. Robertson here. Um, nice to see you. Just, um, you. just following up on that last question. Clearly, you've got your frustrations, and you know, and clearly the, the logistics, which we all know about. Is there anything the organisers can do to sort of mitigate some of those issues for you, but maybe for next season or for the South African sides? I, I, I just, you know, because it's not ideal, obviously, when teams have to come up uh, a long way with a with a weekend side. You know, it doesn't work for anybody, does it? Uh, no, no. I mean, firstly, I mean, bringing weekend sides is that's you know the nature of the competition is you can't play the same guys every week. I think I'm sure you're aware. I've said it in South Africa as well. Is a there's an agreement with my players in our country where you can only play 32 games a year as well. And if you consider, you know, a couple of your guys, some couple of your players might play 13 test matches. That's not too many provincial games that they're allowed to play. So there are those added added constraints that you've got to think about. Uh, from a from a from a logistical point of view, we, you know, we obviously got to deal with Qatar Airways, which means we got to go via Doha. Uh, in itself, that's a, that's not a problem, but but the problem that that you do have is you have to then leave early on in the week because of the fact that you need to get here in time. You know, you can't go via Doha and leave on a Wednesday or Thursday evening and then land here on Saturday morning for obviously for 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 purposes of not arriving at your game, and and I think that's in itself is, is one of the logistical problems we have now. To answer your question, how does that work? I'm sure SA Rugby or the people that put this competition together will have to look at ways in which they can make it a little bit more travel friendly. I mean, for a two meter guy to fly, you know, 21 hours via Doha economy class and then sit on a bus four hours from London Heathrow to Exeter is not really seen as high performance or or the way that you would do it with, with a team that wants to win a competition, you know? So... I mean, I, look, I have banged that drum and it's not for any other reason that I think that it's 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 obvious. Having coached for a long period of time and having coached, obviously, top sides, I just don't think that it's a recipe for, for success. You know, when you talk to teams coming to South Africa, they fly business class direct overnight from London or from Paris as the, as the Leon side did the other night. I mean, that in itself is a massive advantage. So... Look, I, 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 will, I will continue to, to find out solutions. Not in my hands that, but I think that everyone is aware that it's not an ideal situation to be in if you want to. We've got to play the Stormers who won the URC next Friday night. I mean, after this game, back on the bus tomorrow, four hours, fly out of Heathrow on Sunday night, arrive midday on Monday. I mean, there's no way that, a, that any team can then be ready on a Friday, considering you've got to fly down to Cape Town on Thursday as well. So it's a call I had to make, and it's not... Uh, you know, as I said, no disrespect to Exeter. It's it's the way the competition has unfolded, um, and yeah, I mean that I can only control the controllables. And, and just to be just to be absolutely clear, um, for your the reverse fixture against Exeter in January, you'll you'll pick your best available team, or or not necessarily. My strongest, 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 strongest team that I have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How far short, Jake, were you of your best team today? Would you say? Well, I left 21 guys back home. So, I mean, that Thank answers you. your question. 21 you. and, and yeah, 21 and two guys that are injured. So, 23 players didn't come on this tour. Thank you. Um, safe home. Good, safe Thank travels. You. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hello, Jake. Um, yes, Leighton. Okay, Jake, um, Leighton? Jake, just, 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 on, um, just on the 76th minute, um, we've seen how strict the the refs were with head contact um in in the first round um what do you make of 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 the tackle um yeah, look, i know it was late I, in the game I, I must be honest i actually yeah you know, i i thought that matthew Reynal actually showed a lot of a lot of feel for that call i don't think it was you know i mean that's that's nitpicking if you if you really want to you know did his head touch i thought you know, we would have been lucky that if 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 we got a penalty there, um, and and at the same time, I would have been unlucky if it was our guy and he ended up conceding a penalty or a, a yellow card. I don't, I don't think there was any foul play there. I don't think it was intent. I don't think he, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I looked at it over and over, and I didn't for one minute say, "Oh, that's a yellow card." Get rid of the guy, you know. So, and I, I think I'm talking about the same one. You're talking about the the, the bald guy that hit heads with with Nizam Kar. Is that one? Leighton? No, no, it's it's the tackle. Um... Oh, you mean the shoulder, the shoulder, your arms. No. Yeah, you know, look, I think there it's a yellow card. I think if he had hit the guy on the head, it would have been a red card. But, you know, there was mitigating circumstances. Um, 
Cameron Hanukkah was tackled by someone else and was falling to the ground anyway. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think he saw it like that and the common sense prevailed. And, and as I said, there have been times where guys like that get red cards, but mm. I'm, I'm much happier when there's a bit of a feel from a referee based on the fact that, you know, that it wasn't dangerous as in he didn't, he didn't do it deliberately. That guy was falling at his feet. Uh, he didn't hit him on the head, he hit him on the chest. So I suppose that's why that's why it was a yellow later. And then just who put their hands up to make a flight from Doha to Joburg straight Monday to down to Cape? I beg your pardon? Who, who put their hands up to, to make that flight down to Cape Town whenever you guys are coming down? Oh, here? you mean, sorry, you mean to play next week? Yes, 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 yeah, yes. There'll be, there'll be a couple of guys. I mean, obviously that we don't have we don't have enough numbers not to involve some of these guys in the team. But you know, as I said, twenty one guys at home, um, so we probably need three or four from this team to to get themselves ready and be ready for next week as well. So yeah, I mean, just by the nature of numbers, Leighton, probably need about three, four guys that have to obviously uh, get themselves ready. Okay, hopefully we have some order now. Um, can we go Smusi Som Jigeliso, Carl Fabian, and then Simon Rickett? Hi, coach. Um, I think you're referring to Caleb earlier. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the team uh, that you put out, you know, this week out of, out of necessity, you've mentioned the reasons, but was there a feeling that, um, you know, you, you, with a little bit of firepower, you could have pushed Exeter there, especially when the game opened up. I think they were after the 55th minute, um, I think the, the the game was quite open and, and players like that you have at your disposal, the Okanans, Cornells and Turtles, um, you know, could have done some damage. Unfortunately, you know, Vuka's a bit too inexperienced. There were some knock-ons as well, some good chances there that could have made it close. Did you feel some some regret at all that there aren't one or two of your, you know, in-form spring box? Yep. So, Boo, let me tell you then, then then I don't win anything because then I might as well bring everybody here. I mean, the bottom line is I left guys at home to prepare for Friday. If you bring some of your heavy guns here and then you can't do, you get a bit of, a bit of, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another, then you don't win anything. So, yeah, I don't have any regrets. I mean, what we had to do is what we had to do. You know, Bismarck possibly could have scored there, you know, Ronald Ludwig could have scored there, then the game's completely different, you know, then, then the whole na nature of the game. And to be fair, Cebu, uh, you know, 55 minutes looked like it opened up. They had already got the bonus point. They put on some of their reserves. You know, I don't think they would have done that if that game was 13-11, you know, in the 55th minute. So you know, I, I, I think, to be fair, I don't want to be seduced by the fact that they put all the reserves on and we looked like we were you know, what I was most happy about was the first 30 minutes, we had enough chances there uh, to be in the game. And then from the 30th minute to the 40th minute, they scored 16 points. It was 15-7 for such a long period of time. Um, and then we probably lost the game in the in the last 10 minutes of the first half, because then it just became, as I said, 16 points. And all of a sudden, you're 32-7 down is a massive difference at half time. So, yeah. Um, but you know, those are decisions you got to make. So you can't be regretful about the fact there's a there's a plan, and sometimes you lose a battle, but you end up winning the war, and that's basically where we are. Yeah, and uh, just finally for me, just the confidence of these players now. You know, you mentioned how young they are, particularly. Yes, they were surrounded by your veterans like Bismarck and Nizam and Morney. They won one game at home, and they 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 obviously took took one on the chin today. Um, overall. Where should they be thinking now with regards to their standard and their future as 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 players? Look, um, th th when you're not winning, when you're not winning, Sabu, you got to learn, and that's my message to them. We got to learn out of this. Um, I thought some youngsters, you know, it's the first time they've they've played at this level. You know, they might be asked to play Curry Cup this year, uh, and there'll be a massive difference between how they play in Curry Cup compared to what they experienced today. You know, they, there's not many teams that that come here and beat Exeter in Exeter. Uh, there are not many teams that are good enough to keep them out of the 22 and then stop them when they're in the 22. So, I mean, the work on for us is, I think, you know, you can always, as a coach, learn from different teams. And the one thing I would like to learn from these guys and, and, and 
and and build on is that when we get into teams 22s we must be as ruthless and as as efficient as they are you know the right at the end there we were on their line and then we popped the ball up and someone knocked it on now it just showed you know the efficiency of their group of players compared to our players and and that's you know that that is a that'll be a i'm sure they'll put that in their memory bank and when we're practicing at, at loftus and we and we're trying to to try and get those things right, they can then they can then maybe use that memory to to improve their skill sets, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's it. You're right. It was a young team, and I and I say it again, Sabu. Tight head prop, twenty years old, two locks, twenty two and twenty and twenty, you know, Cameron Anacom, twenty. I mean, it's it, it, at one stage our forward pack was like under twenty three years old, you know, as an average, twenty two years old maybe. Now that's that's as tough as it gets when you when you're coming through the ranks. So yeah, I, I I'm I'm obviously disappointed, but I'm also as I said to you that we'll we'll get it right. I mean I'm 100 right. I'll get it right. Jake, tough match. Just one question: the number of names that you mentioned that you need to be competitive in both both competitions needs another eight or ten players, but the the budget that you need. Is going to be about 15 million rand, mm. more or less. Um, so, with those taking those constraints into account and the size of the South African economy, you won't find. I mean, you guys lucky to find another sponsor or investor investor that will invest 15 million rand in the bulls is, is more or less. It's not going to happen. Aren't we fighting a losing battle that we know that we're going to lose? No, Carl. Because if you want to play in a competition, then you've got to either decide you want to play in the competition. And if you want to play in the competition and win it, then you've got to decide you want to win it. And unfortunately, you can't have both. You can't say you're going to win it and then not make decisions that help you win it. So, you know, obviously, we're going to look at that. We'll look at how we can invest more money into our salary caps. And then I think the other thing, Carl, and we need to find out that players who want to play in South Africa can get eligible for playing for the box. You know, patriotism works. Uh, you're giving guys back and you want to be a springbok, you play in South Africa. Um, it's happened in all, and I think the top five countries in the world, four of them do it like that. You want to be an England international, you got to play in England. You want to be an Irish international, you got to play in Ireland. You want to be a New Zealand international, you play in New Zealand. Um, and I think, you know, as I said, four of the three of those teams um, are in the top five in the world. So I think France, you've got to play in France as well to be a French international. So, you know, four of the top five teams have that rule. You know, why do we South Africans need to let our players go overseas and still become Springboks? I mean, what is the, what's the, I mean, patriotism and, and, and being a Springbok and wanting to be a Springbok has got to cost something. You can't, I mean, surely, surely it's got to be a great honor and there's no price to that. You know, there's a wonderful advert with MasterCard that says that's priceless. And uh, for me as an, as a South African, as a national coach, was a national coach and our provincial coach. So don't worry about the 15 million call. Let's make the next generation of players want to be in the Bulls and want to be at the Sharks and want to be at the Stormers and want to be at the Lions. And one of those reasons is that they can play for South Africa. And maybe, um, yeah, this is going to be, um, maybe let the unions or the franchises that play in these competitions and win these competitions benefit directly from the income from the competitions and not spread around to keep 102 other unions that's got, yeah, yeah. That's, that, Look, that's Carl, not I viable. All I can say is as a coach, I can only wear my coaches at, you know, those decisions when it comes to how they spend the money and all that. All Whoa, I want to do is, you. <laughs> no, 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 what I for you say is, I just want you to understand is, I just think, I just Who think, look? Oops, star, you look up. Mabin. Carl, can you hear Sorry, me? I, I, I'm listening, Jake. Yeah, and I'm just saying, uh, I think those... Guys, Carl, let me answer the question to say, I'm not a, I'm not a CEO or decision maker. Like it's it's finance. But what I wanted to ask you, what I wanted to say is that as a coach, I genuinely do think the next cycle of players, we need to make the Springbok jersey, uh, you know, the, the so 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 strong that a guy wants to play in the I mean, we're playing in the same competition. We're playing with the same exposure. You're playing in relatively good teams that can become better if you come home. I mean, the only negative is obviously you don't earn as much, and I understand that. But, hey, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to sacrifice something, Carl.
Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. you, Carl. Pleasure. JJ. Jake, um, so there, there, there's a lot of positives that also came out of these two games, especially players like Bernard van der Linde and Chris Smith that really put their hands up for maybe selection for the Stormers or going forward in the URC. That must be pleasing. Yeah, exactly, JJ. You know, and I think one thing that I you mustn't underestimate, last week we lost Jacques Duplessis injured out for a couple of weeks. We lost... Uh, Marku Janse van Vieren out for probably 12 weeks. I looked at the games last night. I think the Sharks, you know, they Francois Fenter got injured. I think their, their prop got injured. Now, what I'm trying to say about that is the attrition rate of this competition is, is massive. You probably lose two guys a week. Um, and then and when you lose that caliber of player, you need to you need to bring in someone else. So the more these these guys that are playing in this team show me that they can play at this level, the, the better it's going to be for me because it means that you can you can have depth in every position. So yeah, I mean, you know, without singling different players out, I mean, in the last two weeks, a lot of players have showed me that they can take the next step up. And that's you know, that that's pleasing. But I would also, as I said, like about you know, eight or ten, you know, older, older, tougher men that are a bit more hardened than the youngsters that are learning. You know, I think that that would be a great blend for where we want to be as a union. Definitely. Thanks, Jake. Have a safe flight back. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, JJ. Just short, one from, short, short one from me. Thanks, Lunga. Short one from me. Um, last week, um, one of the uh, European um, journalists, and respect to them as well, um, asked about uh, and, and made mention of the fact that um, South Africans inclusions or, or team inclusions brings and I more or less uh, paraphrase what he says or he said um, uh, brings sort of extra value or near or better value to the Heineken Cup. I know that we in our second round and South Africans in the second round do you think at this stage we have brought extra value in a in a, uh, a competition that that needs that, um, and uh, do, do we do we contribute I I any much further to the, towards that? And also taking into consideration what you've just said about uh, loyalty and uh, the South African brand of, of rugby to be played. Yeah, Simon. I mean, I do genuinely think in the first two rounds we've seen that uh, you know the South African participation is is you know, is, is important, this competition. I mean, it's quite interesting today. I saw the crowd was 11,000 something, and obviously it looked like it was a full crowd or it looked like a packed stadium. You know, Loftus, we get 11, 12,000 people there and it looks like we've got nobody there. So, you know, I, last week someone said to me, oh, you do, the crowds aren't, aren't that big, but, you know, we get 11, 12,000 people at our games as well. And when we do, it's, it's not enough. You know, we want 20, 25,000. So, I, I think that it'll take time, Simon. I think it'll take time. It was like Super Rugby when we first started. We didn't get full houses at Super Rugby. And then slowly the, the public start to understand, you know, what the competition's about. They understand, they get to know the players. And then there becomes this groundswell of wanting to support your team. So I think after two rounds, you know, I mean, it's not even finished the two rounds. I'm sure that, uh, you know, Sharks winning in Bordeaux last night is, is going to be good for, for South African rugby. You know, Lions winning last night against Stade Francais, you know, obviously good for South African rugby. So, yeah, I, I do think that just picking up from the crowd when I walked around today, a lot of South Africans, yeah, a lot of Bulls supporters. I mean, they're happy and, and I'm sure that thing will get bigger and bigger. Thanks, Jake. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Caleb, is that an old hand? No, it's a new hand. Thanks. Um... Lunga. Um, Jake, quick one. In terms of your, your player welfare, um, I know this is an inaugural season of the Heineken Champions Cup. You talked about you only have 32 uh, matches that you've got an agreement for the players to make. But looking a little bit forward, maybe it's a bit too much ahead for myself into next year. You have a World Cup. We have test players in that team. These two competitions. Um, are there any discussions in the higher offices that maybe involve you, seeing that you're also flying around in economy to try and Make this a little bit of a better going for the for the players because we've we've seen how they're also going to have to carry on things both physically and mentally. Yeah, no. So the answer is no. There's no discussions at all. I think, you know, hopefully that'll happen between CEOs and presidents. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's basically where CEOs and presidents come into the equation. Um, but yeah, at this point in time, I suppose what I can say, Caleb, no, we haven't discussed it. Tournaments relatively new, very relatively young. 
and it's not just this one, URC as well. You know, maybe next year there'll be some decisions on how they can alleviate. I, I just, I mean, as I said, you can't fly on a Thursday night because you've got to go via Doha. So basically, you've got to take the whole week. And if you play Sunday and you play Friday, it means that on Monday, you can't train. Uh, Tuesday, you've got to fly because you can't fly any later than Tuesday, which means you can't train. You land Wednesday, you train Thursday, you play Friday. Now, I mean, anyone who's in, in any sport will tell you that that doesn't help performance. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think, Caleb, I mean, I said, I don't think it's going to, when the discussion starts, there'll be too many people that will be able to argue against what I'm saying. So, and it's not, you know, I, it sounds like I'm the villain. I'm sound like I'm the guy who's, I'm sure it's the same for every coach. And I'm sure, you know, and, and all I'm doing is I'm wearing my Bulls cap and saying to you, that if I play the Stormers, who are URC champions next Friday, and I have to fly via Doha's economy class, there's no ways to be fair to give myself a realistic chance that I can do it like that. And and I've got to, you know, I've got to bring it to your guys' attention. Now, you know, it always sounds as though, I, as I said, I'm the villain, but you know, I, I told my players, I, I've got a, I've got a bat for them, like like any provincial coach or any national coach would back, you know, back his team. We'll certainly try and get it out there in our writing, Jake, and hopefully somebody somewhere will read and listen. Um, I'm based here in London, so we, we, we're also fighting for good competitions and stuff. So all the best, Jake. And thanks for you. being candid and always open. I always love to hear from you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, thank thanks, you. Longa. Thank you. Thank you.